We can train a muscle at different lengths with the exercises and technique used. In general, it seems that training a muscle in a more stretched position appears to be favorable for muscle growth. But is training a muscle at longer lengths always better? And if so, how can we implement long muscle length training in our lifting routines? First, let's explore what exactly we mean by muscle length and long muscle length training. Well, muscle length simply refers to how much a muscle is stretched while performing resistance training. This is based on the anatomy of each individual muscle. As an example, let's look at the biceps. Both heads of the biceps originate on the scapula, or shoulder blade, and insert onto the radius, one of the forearm bones. So to completely shorten the biceps, we would need to flex the elbow and flex the shoulder, as if we were doing a front double bicep pose. And if we wanted to maximally lengthen the biceps, we would need to extend the elbow and extend the shoulder, as if we were to reach our arms behind our back with a straight elbow. This also relates to resistance training, as we can intentionally manipulate muscle length via exercise selection, range of motion, and technique. Going back to the biceps example, a preacher curl would, on average, put the biceps in a more shortened position compared with an inclined seated dumbbell curl. This is because the shoulder is in a more flexed position during the preacher curl, while it is more extended in the seated inclined dumbbell curl. So the next question is, how does muscle length influence hypertrophy? Well, there are a few different ways that we can look at this question. The first is by looking at range of motion. Overall, full range of motion lifting usually results in superior muscle growth compared with partial range of motion training. However, depending on which portion of the exercise the partial range is performed, partials are sometimes found to be superior compared with full range of motion. This was established in this meta-analysis, which analyzed the evidence on range of motion and hypertrophy. Overall, it was found that full range of motion training results in superior muscle growth compared with partial range. This can be seen with this point being towards the right side of the midline, indicating a superior effect of full range of motion. However, in a subgroup analysis, full range of motion was compared between partials in the shortened and lengthened ranges of motion. And it was found that shortened partials were less effective than full range of motion, but lengthened partials usually result in superior growth compared with full range of motion training. As a more specific example, this study compared the effects of performing leg extensions with four different ranges of motion. 45 untrained women performed 3 to 6 sets of 7 reps of leg extensions at 60% 1RM, which was individualized to each range of motion condition for 12 weeks. One group performed a full range of motion, another performed only the initial range, which is when the quads are most lengthened, the third group performed only the end range, which is when the quads are most shortened, and the last group alternated between the initial and end ranges of motion each training session. It was found that the lengthened and alternating range of motion groups saw the greatest increases in cross-sectional area of both quad muscles measured, the full range of motion was next best, and the partials in the shortened position were least effective. So to summarize, partial range of motion training is usually going to be inferior if you skip the lengthened part of the exercise, for example, the bottom of a squat. However, if you perform partials in the lengthened range, hypertrophy is likely to be similar or potentially more effective compared with full range of motion training. Next, let's look at how exercise selection can influence muscle length and what this means for hypertrophy. Essentially, exercises which train a muscle at longer lengths tend to produce superior growth compared with exercises that train the same muscle at a shorter length, with all else being equal. For example, this study compared the effects of the lying versus seated leg curl exercises on hamstrings hypertrophy. 20 untrained adults performed 5 sets of single leg leg curls for 10 reps with gradually increasing loads of 50-70% to 70 1RM, which were individualized to each condition, 2 times per week for 12 weeks. One leg performed the seated leg curl, which trains the hamstrings at a longer length because the hips are flexed, while the other leg performed the lying leg curl, which trains the hamstrings at a shorter length due to the hips being extended. It was found that all hamstrings muscles achieved superior increases in muscle volume in the leg performing the seated leg curls, shown in the blue, compared with the lying leg curl, shown in the orange. This was except for the short head of the biceps femoris, which saw similar growth in both legs, likely because its length isn't influenced by either the lying or seated leg curl. And lastly, let's look at the effects of stretch-mediated hypertrophy. This refers to the effects of stretching as a stimulus for muscle growth. There is some evidence that intense stretching alone is able to produce meaningful hypertrophy in some cases. 
This was seen in this study, which compared the effects of static stretching versus resistance training on calf muscle growth. 69 recreational athletes from various different sports who also performed semi-regular resistance training performed either one of two different calf training protocols. One group stretched their calves to a 7 to 8 out of 10 pain level in an orthosis continuously for one hour per day for six weeks. The other group performed calf raises on a 45 degree leg press for five sets of 10 to 12 reps to failure three times per week for the same six weeks. As expected, the resistance training group saw significant increases in muscle thickness of both the lateral and medial gastrocnemius muscles, shown in the orange. However, the stretching group also achieved comparable growth too, although not quite to the same extent as the resistance training, shown in the blue. So although I wouldn't recommend static stretching as the most efficient way to build muscle, it does provide some mechanistic evidence. It seems that prolonged intense stretching itself appears to be somewhat of a hypertrophic stimulus, independent of resistance training. And this might be one mechanism by which long muscle length training could be effective. The reason for this stretch-mediated hypertrophy might be explained to some extent by the length-tension relationship. This is the idea that stretching a muscle to its most lengthened position usually involves high muscle tension. This is due to an increase in passive tension experienced by the muscle fibers as it is stretched to longer lengths. It has therefore been hypothesized that this high tension from intense stretching might be a stimulus for hypertrophy, similar to the way in which mechanical tension has been theorized to stimulate muscle growth. However, we should also make sure to keep the whole muscle length discussion in context. While training at longer muscle lengths does appear to be a factor which can enhance the hypertrophic stimulus, it isn't the only factor to consider. There are many other factors which need to be taken into consideration from a holistic training perspective. One potential issue with putting too much attention to long muscle length training is its effects on regional hypertrophy. This refers to which portion of a muscle is hypertrophied relative to others. We often see differences in hypertrophy at more proximal regions of a muscle versus more distal regions. And although there isn't a clear consensus yet, some evidence suggests that regional hypertrophy might be influenced by the length we train a muscle at. For example, this study compared the effects of shortened versus lengthened partials on regional hypertrophy. 19 untrained women performed the same single arm dumbbell preacher curl protocol for 8 weeks. One arm performed only the lengthened half of the curl, while the other arm performed only the shortened half of the curl. It was found that the lengthened partials resulted in superior overall biceps hypertrophy, shown in the blue, compared with the shortened partials, shown in the orange. However, when looking at regional hypertrophy, the middle portion of the biceps, at 50% length, actually grew slightly more from the shortened partials, while the distal biceps, at 70% length, grew more from the lengthened partials. So it is possible that if you were to take the long muscle length training to the extreme, you might be missing out on some regional hypertrophy benefits. Whereas incorporating a variety of different exercises and ranges of motion may be more beneficial for complete muscular development across the entire length of the muscle. Another potential issue with putting too much attention on long muscle length training is that there are many other factors also at play rather than just muscle length. Factors such as stability, coordination demands, local muscle stress, which muscle is the limiter of the set, and so on, are all important considerations for the effectiveness of an exercise. So selecting the exercise which places the target muscle in the most lengthened position might not always be the most effective exercise if it sacrifices some of these other important considerations. For example, this study compared the effects of seated inclined dumbbell curls versus preacher curls on biceps hypertrophy. 38 women with a minimum of 6 month lifting experience performed bicep curl training for 9 weeks. One group performed the seated inclined dumbbell curl, which trains the biceps at a longer length, while the other group performed the dumbbell preacher curl, which trains the biceps at a shorter length. It was found that the preacher curl resulted in superior biceps growth, shown in the blue, compared with the inclined dumbbell curl, shown in the orange, despite the inclined dumbbell curl training the biceps at a longer length. These results might be due to several other factors. The preacher curls have greater stability, possibly allowing more tension to be placed on the biceps. It also may mean that technique is forcibly stricter, since there is less movement from other muscles and joints. Or maybe the preacher curl has a more favorable resistance profile. These are all independent factors from muscle length that can also influence hypertrophy. 
Another example was seen in this study, which compared the effects of the back squat versus hip thrust on lower body hypertrophy. 34 untrained males and females performed either the barbell back squat performed as deep as each participant could manage, or the barbell hip thrust for 3 to 6 sets of 8 to 12 reps, to volitional failure 2 times per week for 9 weeks. It was found that quad and adductor hypertrophy were superior in the back squat group, as expected. However, the glute max experienced similar hypertrophy in both groups, despite being trained at a longer muscle length in the squats compared with the hip thrust. And the hamstrings and glute medius and minimus didn't see any significant growth in either group. Again, these results might be due to many other influential variables. The hip thrust might have provided more stability, allowing the glutes to be trained closer to true muscular failure. The squat might have been limited by other muscles like the quads and adductors before the glutes reach true muscular failure. Or the hip thrust might simply be a less technical movement to perform for untrained lifters, and so on. So the point to make here is that muscle length isn't the only influential variable to consider. And if we focus too much attention on training at long muscle lengths, it might come at the expense of other important training variables. So what does all this mean with regards to practical training strategies? Well, there are a few ways that we can incorporate long muscle length training in our routine to assist muscle growth. The first is via range of motion. At the very least, this evidence reinforces the use of full range of motion training. You especially don't want to skip out on the lengthened portion of the movement, as this is likely going to be the most hypertrophic. For example, you want to make sure you are squatting to full depth and coming all the way down for pressing variations. And in some cases, it might be worth experimenting with lengthened partials. This means reps only in the lengthened range of the exercise. There are two ways in which lengthened partials can be implemented practically. The first and probably most relevant method is to use lengthened partials to extend a set. Once you have reached failure, or close to it, you can usually perform a few additional reps with partial range of motion. And depending on the exercise, this could be either in the lengthened or shortened range. For example, a seated cable row is easiest in the initial part of the exercise when the back muscles are most lengthened. And it is most difficult in the end range when the back muscles are most shortened. So once we hit failure, or close to it, using full range of motion, we can usually continue the set by performing some additional partial reps in the lengthened position. However, this would be less applicable for an exercise like a squat for example. Most squatting variations are easiest in the top position where the quads and glutes are most shortened, and they are hardest in the bottom position when the quads and glutes are most lengthened. So if we get close to failure through a full range of motion, the only way to continue the set is to perform the shortened range of the exercise, which is probably the least effective portion. And the second way in which lengthened partials can be implemented is in a more literal way, only performing lengthened partial reps. This means performing around half to two thirds of the full range of motion only in the most lengthened position of the exercise. For example, lengthened partials for bicep curls would involve performing only the bottom range of the exercise and skipping the top position. This would be performed for all reps in each set. The next strategy to implement long muscle length training is by manipulating tempo. This refers to the speed that each rep is performed at. Since the lengthened range of an exercise appears to be the most hypertrophic portion in most cases, we might be able to improve the hypertrophic stimulus by biasing this range via manipulating tempo. Although we don't have any direct evidence on this topic, it is likely to be beneficial to slow down the eccentric tempo in the lengthened position and speed up the tempo in the shortened position. This will allow us to spend more time in the lengthened position and less time in the shortened position. And this will mean we will be generating more time under tension at long muscle lengths, possibly making it slightly superior compared with a more standard tempo. Furthermore, we could also implement short pauses at the most lengthened range to spend even more time there, and avoid stopping any reps in the shortened range. For example, we could manipulate tempo of a bench press in the following ways. Control the eccentric on the bottom half slower than the top half. Avoid using the stretch shortening cycle to bounce out of the bottom position. Pause in the bottom position for a very brief moment. Avoid stopping altogether in the top position, and you could even implement what we would call a soft lockout, meaning you don't fully lock out at the top. The next strategy is to be strategic with exercise selection. As we have discussed, muscle length isn't the only consideration for exercise selection, but it does seem to have an influence. 
With all other factors equated, training a muscle at a longer length will usually be slightly more favorable for muscle growth. So if you have the choice between two similar exercises, it is probably best in most cases to select the one which trains the target muscle in a more lengthened position. Furthermore, even if two exercises both train the muscle at a similar length, it is probably worth selecting the one which biases more tension in the lengthened range. But once again, make sure to consider muscle length as one component of exercise selection, not as the only factor which influences hypertrophy. And the last practical strategy to implement long muscle length training is using the stretch as a sensation to guide training decisions. This refers to the feeling of stretch under load on the target muscle during an exercise. While this isn't a perfect indicator of the hypertrophic stimulus, feeling a big stretch in a muscle group is probably a good general sign that the muscle is being exposed to high tension in a lengthened position. This can be used in a similar way to the proxies of muscle soreness, the mind-muscle connection, and muscle pump as a short-term indicator of the hypertrophic stimulus. There are two primary ways in which the stretch sensation can be used to inform training decisions. First is for technique manipulation. Trainees can make slight technique changes to try and train the target muscle at its longest length for that exercise. And the stretch sensation can be a good gauge that high tension is being placed on the muscle at a long length. For example, a lifter might adjust their technique to try and maximize the stretch sensation on the hamstrings during a Romanian deadlift. And second is to help with exercise selection. As we mentioned, selecting exercises which train a muscle at long lengths or place high tension in the lengthened position are usually going to be favorable for hypertrophy. So we can use the stretch sensation to try and get a rough idea of which exercises are effectively placing high tension on the target muscle at long muscle lengths. Based on all this information, let's now discuss some practical recommendations. Overall, it seems that training a muscle at longer lengths appears to be highly effective for muscle growth compared with training at shorter muscle lengths. However, it is important to note that training at longer muscle lengths is one of many variables which influences hypertrophy. If we place too much attention on trying to train at long muscle lengths, we might be inhibiting the hypertrophic stimulus by failing to consider other important variables. In any case, with all other factors equated, training a muscle at long lengths will likely result in superior growth in most cases. In practice, we can manipulate what lengths we are training any given muscle at through variables such as exercise selection, range of motion, and tempo. Here are some practical strategies to help maximize the hypertrophic stimulus via long muscle length training. Make sure to at least include the lengthened range of a movement using full range of motion. And you could potentially even implement partial range of motion in the lengthened position only for some exercises where it is appropriate. Manipulating tempo to spend more time in the lengthened range and less time in the shortened range. Selecting exercises which train the target muscle at longer average muscle lengths or which bias more tension at the lengthened range of the exercise. And lastly is that we can use the stretch sensation to help make informed training decisions about technique manipulation and exercise selection. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.